So um, thanks everyone, it's nice to see you all here. Um, I suppose I'd better have the first slide, I guess. Um, so um, as you've heard, I'm from New Zealand, uh, which means I talk funny. Um, and so I apologise for that. But if, and if any of you absolutely can't understand a word I'm saying, um, you better stick your hand in the air fairly early on and uh, we'll see if we can find an interpreter. Um, I, for those of you that don't, um, I'm sure that you have heard of the All Blacks, um, probably, most of you. Um, but I was just going to tell you how far away New Zealand is. It's about as far away from here as you can possibly get. Um, the flight time from my home to Dublin was 26 hours and the total travelling time was just over 40 hours. So I'm not sure that I'm ever going to come back. Uh, not because I don't like the place, but just it's, uh, it's a hell of a long way. Um, <clears throat> so obviously from New Zealand, uh, my job tonight is to give you a New Zealand perspective. I know very little about Irish sheep farms, so I'm going to speak from a New Zealand perspective, but I think you'll find that most, if not all, of what I talk about will be relevant because from what I gather things are not that different and I, I've talked to quite a few Irish farmers already and you look, apart from the voice, you all sound and look just like New Zealand farmers so I suspect there's a fair amount of similarity on that. Um, so um, I'm just going to, by, by way of introduction, uh, New Zealand, if, if none of you have been there, um, very much like Ireland, it's an island nation um, so it's never very far to the sea, but it's probably a lot more mountainous. We have over 400 peaks higher than 9,000 feet, which um, is you know pretty high, and there's a lot of them. And we have vast tracts of native forest. So flat land or flattish land for farming is somewhat uh, limited, simply by the volume of mountains. And uh, we have a population similar to yours, 5 million people. But 26 million sheep and about 10 million cattle of, of a split into beef, beef and dairy. The, um, in the old days, when I was quite a bit younger, we probably had 60 million sheep. But the boom in the dairy industry over the last um, 10 or 15 years has basically meant that all the profitable, highly productive flat land is now covered in pivot irrigators and black and white cows. So the sheep farming has, has regressed very much into hill country, or at least country that's too steep for cows to walk on. Um, what's a typical New Zealand sheep farm look like? Um, I, I looked up some stats just to give you a feel for what it's like. Uh, the average farm, 374 hectares, just under 1,000 acres, with an average of 700, roughly 700 breeding ewes and 50 breeding cows, um, which is probably a bit bigger than you're used to. Um, what's a farm look like? This farm. This is a photograph of a farm that we worked on uh, quite extensively for quite a few years. And all the, all the pasture land that you can see there is a single farm. In fact, that's about a third of the farm. Um, Seven and a half thousand acres, 11,000 breeding ewes and 1,000 um, Angus beef cows um, run by a manager and four full-time staff, so five, five full uh, management uh, workers on the place and um, transport would be almost exclusively by four-wheel motorbike with a bit of horse. So some of that country is too steep for a motorbike and it would be, uh, they would muster and get around on horses. So horses are still used on some of these big farms. So um, to my view, that's a sort of fairly typical uh, breeding, new breeding farm on New Zealand today. So <coughs> the farms are possibly a bit different. Uh, from what I've seen so far, and I haven't seen very much, but I've done a fair bit of looking out the car window. Um, our farms are different, but we share many of the same problems. Um, I'm actually quite pleased to say that you have a few problems that we don't have, which is quite nice from our point of view. So you have a few issues that we don't have. Um, but the one I'm here to talk about tonight, of course, is um, resistance to anthelmintic drenches or wormers. And I, this is a graph, I don't, I don't really need you to look at this very much. Um, except to say that this is the proportion of uh, tests, and this is done over the last two, two to three years, this is the proportion of tests that have failed to uh, achieve the sort of efficacy that we would expect from a wormer, and this is just a range of uh, drench actives along the bottom, 
And the, the, what I'm trying to tell you is that we've got to the stage now where resistance is extremely common. Um, in fact, it's become the norm. This is just um, some data I pulled off the Chagas website for, uh, for Ireland, for white, yellow and ML drenches, and these are the corresponding figures out of here for New Zealand. So we're actually very similar. The, 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 roughly the presence of resistance is very similar in both countries. And I guess what I'm, <coughs> what I'm trying to um, allude to is the fact that when I started my career, which to me doesn't seem like very long ago, but probably actually was, um, resistance was quite unusual. And it was so unusual that it was almost um, a topic of conversation in the pub. It was something that people talked about because it was so unusual to have resistant worms on a farm. Today it's completely the other way around, and the thing that's unusual and is worthy of comment is a farm that has no resistance. And uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not entirely sure about here, but at home I could take you to a farm that has no drench resistance, but I couldn't take you to very many. It, so nowadays if you want to find a farm that's got drench resistance, you just go out the gate and walk down the road, and the first farm you come to will have resistant worms. So it's, it's become very much the norm, and it's an everyday occurrence. And what that means, of course, is that every decision you make um, in your day-to-day -day life about how to deal, what you're going to do about parasites, has to be couched in the background that you almost certainly have drench resistance of some sort on your farm. And I'd be very surprised if there's many people here that don't. Um, so... Okay, so that's, that sort of tells us that resistance, resistance is an issue and in it's, and it's, and every likelihood it's going to get worse. Right? Um, to me as a career scientist, that's extremely disappointing. It's disappointing to the point where it's almost depressing and I almost quit my job and became a fishing guide, um, except for the fact that I'll probably go broke. But, um, and the reason I say that is because I've spent the last 35 years trying to come to grips with the problem of how, what select, how do we select for drug resistance and how do we prevent it. And um, I think we've actually been very successful and we know how to do that thing, those things. Um, and I've got um, some confidence in saying that because um, we've taken a lot of... I'm going to go back, sorry. I, um, I'm going to go... Not only have we done the science to understand how to select, what selects for drug resistance, we've taken that information and we've put it into practice on real commercial farms all over the country and we've demonstrated beyond doubt that it works. So we know how to manage drug resistance. But we've failed completely, as far as the industry goes, in having any effect, really, on what's happened across the industry. It's getting worse and it's still getting worse. And we're now getting to the point where it's becoming a real issue. And I mean a real issue, and I can tell you some stories about that if you want. So <clears throat> the question is why? And, and this is a question I've been grappling with and some of my colleagues is, if we know the answer, why have we been so ineffectual at actually making any change? And it could be that farmers are just don't listen, um, or it could be that we're giving them the wrong message, or it could be a whole lot of things. But I think there's, there's three things I want to sort of touch on a bit tonight, or at least the first two. And the first is that farmers don't test. Right? Now, I'm pretty sure, because I talked to a whole lot of farmers on, on uh, Tuesday night, and I got pretty much told that farmers in Ireland don't test, or don't want to test. Um, and that makes them exactly the same as farmers in New Zealand. Um, they have a, almost a pathological hatred of going out and collecting faecal samples to see if your worm is working. Um, and I've been told many times by Kiwis uh, that it's too difficult and it's too expensive. Now, that could be a reflection on the thriftiness of farmers, um, who I would argue, at least New Zealand farmers, I'm not going to cast derision on you guys, New Zealand farmers have short arms and deep pockets, and they really struggle to reach the bottom of their pockets to pay for things. Um, but whatever the reason, and I, I'm going to come back and tell you why I think the reason is, farmers don't want to test the efficacy of their drugs. The other problem is that we've, we've got a whole generation of people um, who have grown up with a drench gun in their hand and they've always had the access to cheap, effective, safe drugs that work phenomenally well. And unless you're considerably older than me, 
you've probably never lived at a time when you didn't have those drugs available. So they've always been there, there's always been something that would work, and they've always worked, and you know how to use them, and you're comfortable to use them. Um, <clears throat> and so it's, it's very hard to change something that's always worked for you. The third reason that applies to us, and maybe doesn't apply to you, but it might, is farmers get conflicting messages. So in New Zealand, vets are a significant retailer of drugs, including wormers. And so we have drug companies all telling different stories because they're all trying to sell their own products. We have vets who are always trying to sell products because that's how they make most of their money and pay their wages. And then you have advisors and people like me who go around and try and give you evidence-based advice, um, which we think is right. And so I know for a fact that farmers just get so bamboozled by conflicting messages, they simply don't know who to believe and who to listen to, and so they don't do anything, because they don't know what to do. All right, now the problem with that, particularly with the first two, is in New Zealand, for sure, we are now getting into a situation where we're running out of drenches, we're running out of stuff and they're starting to fail, and there are some absolute horror stories about people um, getting into trouble. I had a, I had a farmer uh, six months ago tell me he lost $100,000 worth of capital stock, so 60,000 euros of dead animals over lactation to uh, a resistant worm population that he didn't know he had. And that's not a very nice place to be, and he was very unhappy, and he was drastically trying to get trying to figure out how, what he was going to do and how he was going to deal with it. So when farmers tell me that testing is too difficult and too expensive, I don't believe them because compared with the cost of a, of a total drench failure, in terms of cost and difficulty, testing is really cheap. So I just want to give you an analogy because um, this is an absolute positive description of what it's like and um, I'm going to talk about cancer for about two seconds. The biggest killer of men in New Zealand is stomach cancer, prostate cancer, and skin cancer. Uh, and we all know, and you all know, and I'm absolutely certain that you all know, that the most effective strategy to avoid dying of cancer is early detection. Uh, if you find it early, and you read the signs and you get tested, then, um, then all things are possible. Modern medicine can do wonders. If you refuse to get a test and you don't, see the signs and you don't try, then the prognosis becomes considerably more dire. So we all know that, I'm sure we all know it, and I know it. Um, I'm not sure that I'm any better at it, but I'm, I certainly know what I'm supposed to be doing. And so drench resist, think of drench resistance or wormer resistance exactly the same. And we know this is true, we know this because we've done it, we've done it over and over again. If you detect resistance early, we can fix it, and we can fix it relatively easy, and it's not that hard to do, and it won't cost you all that much money. If you ignore it and pretend that it's not a problem, and you don't have it, then when it does hit you, it's going to hurt, and it's going to hurt a lot, and it's really difficult to fix. All right? So I want to come back to this most farmers won't test. So I've talked to hundreds, if not thousands, of farmers over the last 20 years. i talked to a lot of them, and I've heard... I've heard one saying more than I've heard anything else. And the farmer and the conversation goes something like this. I go to a meeting like this, we have a cup of tea or a beer at the end of the night, and I end up in a conversation with a farmer, and he goes, that drench resistance, you know, that's a real problem. Um, it's a big problem for the industry, and I'm really pleased that I don't have it. And I turn around and say, so what was your test result? Oh, I haven't done a test. Oh, but how do you know you haven't got resistance? Because my stock look fine. Right? Now that, that last line is the key. My stock look fine. Now that tells me, and I've heard it many times, that farmers believe that they will see a, resist, a, a worm of resistance problem, they will see it coming, and they're wrong, because you won't. So, this is some sheep here. These are some good old-fashioned Romney... New Kiwi Romney um, ram lambs or weather lambs. Um, so my question to you is, what do you think about them? Do they look all right? 
Are they, do they look like they're desperately in need of a drench? Do they, um, would you be happy with those on your farm? And it's a rhetoric. You can answer if you want, of course. I'm quite happy to get into the debate. But I took a bunch of Kiwi sheep farmers, you know, career lifetime Kiwi um, sheep farmers out, and I showed them those sheep and the, and the other ones in the trial, and I asked them that question, and they said, yeah, that'll right. Yeah, I'd be happy with those. Oh, I wouldn't be unhappy with those sheep on my farm. The message is that when they were in a trial that we ran and they had been repeatedly treated with a drench that was only about 50% effective. And when we sold them, their sale value was 10% lower than the animals in the paddock next door, which were treated exactly the same, but were treated with a fully effective wormer. And at today's prices, that's about 12 euros a lamb of loss for every sheep in that paddock. And Nobody that I could talk out there could see it, and I couldn't see it, and the farmers I took couldn't see it. So you've got to realise that if you think you're going to see a problem, you are wrong. Right? What happens in New Zealand, you will see it, and this is surprisingly common, is that a, a, fair, a fair proportion, pro probably close to 50% of farmers, discover they have a resistance wormer problem when they find dead lambs in the paddock. Right? Think about that. And that's happened many times over. They're not all dead, but there's a few dead ones. And the rest, of the, and so you go out in the morning, drive around on your motorbike or your whatever you use, and suddenly, oh, there's a dead lamb. Oh, shit, there's another one. Oh, I better go and have a look at that. Suddenly there's four or five or six or ten, and then you have a close look at the rest of the lambs, and oh, they don't look quite as good as they should. And that's, that's the start of the conversation with the veterinarian or the advisor that will lead you, after you've spent a whole lot of money doing a whole lot of tests to figure out what's wrong, to realise you have drench resistance. And you can take my word for it, that's absolutely the truth. All right, the other problem, of course, as I said, is that drenches are um, so effective that we've had them forever. They, they've been phenomenally effective, and it's a great system until it stops working, right? And... Over, at, at least in my country, and, and maybe it's the same here, is that what's happened over a long period of time is that the number of treatments given has slowly crept up. Right? I, I pre-weaning drench. I know you guys do because you have an nematodirus. In New Zealand, it's common, but, some, but not always. So pre-weaning drenching of lambs is done sometimes and sometimes not. But once you start doing it, it gets done all the time. And then it becomes into the autumn. And so all these things become habit, and then you do it all the time. The drenching of adult sheep, drenching of two tooths, all this stuff. I put this picture in here because I just wanted to show you this. Um, uh, and I don't know whether you have these here, but this is a conveyor system. So these guys are contractors. So a farmer can ring a contractor, and they'll turn up with a conveyor system, usually on a big trailer. And they'll funnel sheep in one end, and they will have a couple of guys standing there, and they will stand there all day drenching lambs. And there's a young woman there with a vaccine, looks like a vaccine. So she will be vaccinating and drenching, and they can put through thousands of sheep in a day. Vast numbers. And it just becomes so easy for the farmer. All he's got to do is have a um, run around with his dog and bring that, keep the lambs up so that they go in the conveyor fast enough. And um, so the technology has got easier and easier, and it's become more and more. And that works really well until it stops. Now the problem with that is this, um, there's a problem with that approach and that intensive use of drenches. And there's a thing called refugia, which is a technical term. Have any of you heard of the term refugia before? And do you know what it means? Can someone wave your hand in the air and say that you know what I'm talking about? Or do I have to go through all the detail of explaining it? No? One or two? I know you do. Um, <coughs> All right, so refugia, it's, it's actually, it, it can be complicated, but it's actually really simple. And it, the story goes like this. You need a refuge, a refuge somewhere on your farm where you can maintain and have surviving worms that you can kill with a drench. Now, that, what a ridiculous idea. Why would you want that? I want to get rid of all the worms. I don't want any. Well, good luck with that, because as far as I know, that's never happened anywhere in the world, and it's probably never going to. Uh, certainly, you're not going to do it with a drench gun. But think about it. If you don't have any worms that you can kill, the alternative is to have only have worms that you can't kill. 
right? So you need both. You need some good worms, and you don't want any bad worms. The good worms are the ones that you can kill, and the bad ones are the ones that you can't kill. And you've got to have both. Otherwise, you only have the bad sort. Right? And that's the place you don't want to get. And that's the whole, fundamentally, that's the whole principle to this idea of refugia. So it's just a refuge. But it, and it's a mindset thing. It's like, where on your farm are some animals that are turning over and passing drug-susceptible eggs onto the ground? Because you have to have some. If you don't have some, you're in trouble. And when you have these high drench use things that I was just talking about, you don't have any. It's really, really hard. And so intensive use of drenches or uh, wormers is a recipe for disaster because there's nowhere for the susceptible worms. It's a weird way of thinking about it, but it's actually um, it's quite important. And so the more you treat, the harder it is for the, for the good worms to survive, and then you, you have nothing left but bad worms, which is what you don't want. That's the one place you don't want to be. And this graph here, this is just a graph I put in to give you an idea of what the, the relationship looks like. This is from a modelling study where we did, we put large, we did a whole lot of comparisons of different strategies for using wormers. We looked at all different, we put together all the ideas that we could think of and we, and we got this huge big data set and we thought, how can we summarise this? And so we plotted the average number of treatments per animal per year against how fast drug resistance develops. And that's what the curve looks like. So if you're up in here and you're giving lots and lots of drenches to all your animals, you're in trouble. Sooner or later, it's going to bite you and it's going to come back and it's going to be a problem. You have to get down this part, but once you get here, the benefits go up. They don't, it's not a straight line. It's, a big, it's very much an exponential curve. So this refugia thing is actually really, really important. It's probably the key thing you need to get your head around in terms of slowing drug resistance. So how do you do that? There's dozens of ways you can do it. And I've heard many people say, I've heard farmers say, I've heard vets say, and I've heard all kinds of people say, that refugia stuff, that's really difficult, isn't it? It's not difficult at all. I've done it on farms all over the place. It's surprisingly easy. The hard part is just figuring out what to do, but you can, there's always a way that will fit with your farming system. And the problem is, you get people like me who don't know very much about farming, I walk onto your farm and say to you, I want you to do that. And you go, bugger off, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do that, it doesn't. Why would I want to do that? Because I'm trying to tell you what to do instead of letting you decide what you're going to do in order to achieve the end. Does that make sense? So whatever you do, it has to fit into your system and it has to be easy. And I'm suggesting to you that there will be a way on, on almost every farm in the world where you can do that, the trick is to find out, is to find that easy way of doing it. And I've got some examples, but um, I'm not going to go through them too much because they're all New Zealand-based ones. But the easiest, and m easiest by far, is this issue about... Um, sorry, I'm going to go back. Uh, push the wrong button again. Um, is not drenching adult sheep. Why am I saying don't drench adult sheep? Because you need your lambs to grow fast. You want them to grow fast so that you can kill them and get paid for them. Right? Adult sheep are not in a growth phase. They're already up to, up to their, their best weight. You can alter their condition, but you're not going to make them grow any bigger. They're as big as they're going to be. They've got fully developed immune systems. And with good feed and good condition, they're more than capable of dealing with worms. So the opportunity to take worms out, wormers out of the system is far easier with adult sheep than it will ever be with lambs. So in New Zealand, the adult sheep story is the one is where the vast majority of people are chasing the refugia story. All right. Um, and I, but I just want to I want to diverge, and I want to give you a little bit of science. Um, one, because I'm quite chuffed that we did this, and it took us a lot of effort and a lot of money. Um, but I also want you to go home with something that you might not have seen before because you might have all heard what I'm saying and you might already know it. So we did, um, we did a very expensive and a very long uh, replicated field trial where we compared the rate at which resistant worms built up 
on many farms and we compared that with different drenching or drench use strategies. And we compared the use of a long-acting pre-lamb with an oral drench at lamb tailing versus no drench to use. And the bottom one is um, no drench to use, leaving some lambs untreated as a source of refugia. And I'm not suggesting you should do that, but that's what the treatments were. And what we found, and this is just one of many measures, but this solid line here, this is the drench resistance status in the worm population over a five-year period. And when we put a long acting into the ewes, resistance got up to this level after five years. When we didn't drench the ewes at all, it, it got up to there. So that's about twice as high as that. When we put a long acting into our ewes, we doubled the rate at which resistance developed. It develops much, much faster when you put those long acting treatments into the adult ewes. Right? And, and you may have heard that before, and we did that quite a few years ago, and we've continued working in that space. And we've been doing a lot of work on some of these things uh, in the last few years. And this is some data for moxidectin injection, which I assume is the main long-acting that you guys would use. And the thing with moxidectin and with the other ML trenches is that they're present in milk, they're present in colostrum, and for moxidectin, it crosses the placenta in, of a lamb before it's born, and it's present in the tissue and in the brain tissue of lambs at birth. So when you put a long-acting moxidectin into your ewes pre-lamb, the day after you drench those ewes, you're drenching the lambs. And you're drenching those lambs every day at an unknown dose rate until they're about eight or nine weeks old and they stop suckling. Yeah? And this is the data. This is the, I've got a heap of this data, but this is just one example. So this is moxidectin concentration. The solid line is the concentration in the plasma of the treated ewe. That ewe was treated there with moxidectin injection. This is the amount of moxidectin in the colostrum and in her milk. Hot, really high concentrations. And this is the amount of moxidectin in, the, in her two lambs from the day they were born until they were about eight or nine weeks old. So that tells you that you're doing things that you probably didn't realise you were doing. That's, that's a bit of a surprise. Uh, there's a whole lot of implications from some of that, and I'm not going to talk about them all, but I'm going to talk about this one. So what we did with those experiments, when, when those lambs were starting to forage, we started to trickle-dose them with worms that were either resistant or susceptible to moxidectin. And what we found was there was enough moxidectin in those lambs which had never been treated to prevent susceptible worms from getting in and establishing, but not enough to keep the resistant worms out. So when you drench a ewe with long-acting, with a moxidectin injection, you are selecting for resistant worms in the lambs prior to weaning, even though you've never treated them. How cool is that? If you're a parasitologist, it's really cool. If it's a farmer, it's probably not so much fun. But I thought you might like be interested to know that. Okay, sources of refugia. There's, as I've said, in my mind, there are many ways you can get this refuge for susceptible worms, but it's a thinking thing. You have to start thinking about where on my farm am I retaining some worms that I can kill? Because, simply because if you don't do that, you're going to end up with worms that you can't kill, and that's, that's going to lead you to all kinds of grief. There's a... I've just given a couple of examples here, and I don't really want to dwell on these, but I want to talk about the last one. If, you, if you're putting your lambs on clean pastures, so hay aftermath, then you can extend the interval between, between treatments, and you can allow some susceptible worms to turn over, right? You can leave some lambs undrenched, but that's not very popular where I come from. It's, it's much more difficult to do and not have a production cost. Um, but the one that's really cool, and this, I, this strategy came, didn't come from me, it came from a farmer who said to me, why didn't you tell me what you were trying to do? Instead of telling me what to do, he said, I can do that, it's easy. So he, had a, he has all his lambs in a lamb finishing block and I was trying to get him to leave lambs undrenched. He said, bugger that, I'm not going to do that. He said, why don't I just take my tail end two tooths that are in my ewe flock that look like they need a drench, I'll take them out and I'll put them in with the lambs I won't drench them, 
and now they're on better feed, more feed, they'll pick up, their body condition will improve, and I've achieved two things, and I've done almost nothing. And I went, that's a good idea. And I've started talking about that with farmers around the country, and there's quite a few people doing that. It's really easy to do. They don't look like lambs, so you don't get confused. You don't need to ear tag them or anything. You just, and it works. Right, so, a whole lot of gloom and doom, a whole lot of things that you need to do, but I want to talk about this idea that resistance is forever. So you may have been told by people like me, because that's what I do, I go around and tell people how clever I am and what I know, but um, you've probably heard that resistance is forever and once you get it, you can't, you can't come back. Well, that's not true. That's absolutely not true. It used to be true, but it's not. Um, and we discovered this sort of by accident. We, we went on to a whole lot of farms all over New Zealand that had really bad drug resistance, or significant drug resistance anyway, and we worked with the farmer, the vet, farm consultant, and we put in place management strategies, a whole lot of changes to the farm system to try and prevent resistance from getting worse. Because at that stage we didn't think it would go away, we just thought it wouldn't get any worse. And what we discovered was that it actually did start to go away. And so these are some graphs. Uh, each of these dots is a, is a drench test result on a real farm. There's seven farms in each of these tests. And we did it every year for five years. And for both for ivermectin, levamazole, and the BZ drenches, over time, those lines sloped up. The efficacy improved. Now, I can't tell you exactly what caused that because on every farm we change different things. But we maintained productivity, we introduced refugia strategies, and we improved the efficacy of the wormers over a period of five years. So today, in New Zealand, we have farmers, quite a few farmers, who are actively changing their farming system and managing to get reversion, and it's working. So that's the good news. The bad news is that it requires significant change to the farming operation and the farming business. In other words, as I said at the beginning, if you get to the point where you're in real trouble and resistance is really bad, it's hard and it's expensive to come back. So the good news is you can come back and things will improve. The bad news is it's bloody hard to do. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of work and a lot of change. There's a quote from Henry Ford, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So when I go onto a farm that's got three-way drench resistance and is in all kinds of trouble, and I go to the farmer and say, well, I want you to change this, this, and this, and he goes, well, why? Well, because if you don't, you're going to have more dead sheep. Like it's... So, you, and I mean change, there's significant change to the farming operation. So that's the good and the bad. Um, the last thing I just want to mention, and, it's, and I, I'm sure it's a case here, and it's definitely a case at home, because resistance is becoming more and more common, when you sh if you buy animals or you shift them onto your farm, the chances that they're bringing resistant worms with them is going up and up and up all the time. And we have farms in New Zealand today that have got really bad drench resistance, and we can trace that back to them bringing animals onto the farm so that resistance came in in a truck. And that's becoming very common. So this idea, secure the borders, don't buy someone else's resistance problem, is actually becoming absolutely essential. If you don't do that, um, you're going to be in real trouble. I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail of how you should do that, because that's already available to you. It's on the Chagas website, it's in all the media and stuff that I've been looking at before I came over. Right, so what am I saying? What I'm trying to tell you is that preventing drug, drug resistance and parasites of sheep is actually not that difficult. But you have to test. If you're not testing, then you're flying blind, you don't know what you're doing, and you're probably going to end up in the same, you're going to end up in trouble. It's, that's mostly likely the answer. And testing is really easy and cheap compared with the alternative. This thing called refugia, if you don't know about it and you've never heard of it, then I would suggest that maybe you might like to have a read of some documentation somewhere because um, it's, the, it's the key to everything. 
And, it, and take my word for it, it's not as hard to do as you might initially think. It actually works and um, you can do it. The final thing is there is hope. Right? It's not the end of the world, but it might hurt a bit, quite a bit, um, to come back and get back to where you want to be. And my final comment is if you don't want to test or take action, I wish you luck. And uh, I didn't have any that day. I was, uh, one of my mates took that picture and I didn't even see that fish and I stood there in the rain getting wet. But hey, I was fishing, so that's okay. Thank you very much.